I'm Ellen Mary. And I'm Michael Perry. And he's a plant geek. And she's a plant addict. And, and this, this is, is the Plant Based Podcast. Podcast. <laughs> This is more than just a gardening podcast. We'll be exploring the world of plants from every possible angle. We'll be talking about plant-based diets, plant materials and fabrics, the well-being qualities of plants, and giving plenty of gardening tips and tricks. So we'll be chatting worldwide to companies and individuals that are being creative with plants in new and exciting ways. From fabulous flower crowns to foliage-filled lounges, botanical moisturizers to bamboo clothing it's all here and it's all made of plants hey guys how you doing i feel excited and breathless all in one because this is an episode that has been left to me and as you guys might know we're between the series at the moment so between series two and series three Ellen and I have done some specials all on our lonesome. So this is my first one where I'm the only one controlling the knobs and whistles. Not whistles? Knobs and levers. I don't know. Um, I'm kind of like a real shoot from the hip kind of guy as well. So I've written some rough notes, but I'm really kind of half looking at them, half not looking at them. Uh, Yeah, so... I'm just going to give a bit of an intro, tell you what my episode is going to be about, uh, give you a few little teasers, and I'm also going to pull up some of your interaction on social media as well, because I asked you a little bit about your New Year resolutions and also about Fantasy Plant League. So let's see how that goes. I'm not sure if I'm talking too quickly, too slowly. It's a very hard medium to kind of get right. And I remember when I was listening to Ellen's gossip on her own just a couple of weeks ago, I thought like, what are you doing, girl? She was like talking in slow motion. And I kind of understand why she was doing that now. I'm going to have to remember to take a breath from time to time, though. So here we go. Live breath just for you. (sighs) Mm. Anyway, yeah. I am really that kind of shoot from the hip guy, don't really like to plan too much, tend to kind of fly by the seat of my pants most of the time. But I've got a few notes here and I'm going to tell you what we've got coming up in this episode because it's all about new plants, kind of new trends as well in the garden place. Because if you know anything or everything about me already, I am basically new plant buff. I was working with Thompson and Morgan for 18 years, introducing brand new plants to gardeners at home. So I've got lots of experience with, you know, finding new concepts for plants, finding new breeds of plants, also putting together new trends and new groups of plants, and always to give something fresh, new and different to the customer, and something they wouldn't have seen before, something that gets them excited but also something that often solves a gardening problem as well. Some of the best examples of that would be Buddleia Buzz, for example, which is a Buddleia, which is a quarter of the size of a usual Buddleia, and it's also pretty much sterile. So this is then a Buddleia that's not going to take over your garden. So this is more of a garden-friendly Buddleia. So I've been obsessed with new plants ever since I was a teenager, It's really kind of my career USP, you might say. So in this episode, I've actually got two different little visits that I made. So the first one is with Syracuse Mole, who is marketing at uh, Bacon Camp, which is a Dutch breeding company. We worked with them many, many years ago on the Tom Tato project. Now, this was a plant that was marrying up tomatoes and potatoes on that same plant. No GMO, all they used was glue. It's an amazing plant, and we'll tell you a little bit about the story behind that, and also tell you about the next step in that project, what we then grafted together, and perhaps give you some ideas of other plants that could be created in the natural world by that grafting process. With Syracuse, we will also talk about begonias. 
Now, she's pretty much become the queen of begonias because Bacon Camp have now bred indoor, outdoor begonias. So begonias that can be used indoors, outdoors, same plant. Also fragrant begonias, some new trailing begonias too. We'll touch on some of the Thompson Morgan breeding that was linked to that. And maybe in a future episode, I might even talk to the former breeder at Thompson & Morgan and kind of really lift the lid on that kind of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory of plants that he was, he was working with. And I was working alongside him for many years too. So I'll send him a desperate email and see if we can get him on the podcast. Next, we also talk about dahlias with Syracuse. And there's some big changes in the dahlia world that means they're accessible to anybody whatever space you've got. At the end of our chat with Syracuse, we'll also talk about cultural differences in growing in the UK as opposed to the Netherlands and also talk about the appetite of plants that those people have and how that is different. Very interesting little piece tagged on the end there. Then the next part of the podcast is with Danziga. And this is an Israeli company that I was very lucky to visit just about uh, six weeks ago, we talked to Yael, who is the breeder and also product manager, and we look at the plant which took the public and the industry by storm over the last three years. And that is a plant called Petunia Queen of Hearts. And ironically, that's not a plant that they tried to breed. It was one that already existed, and they just noticed by chance that it had one very different quality about that plant. So find out a bit more about that when we talk to Yael. Also, we talk about basket mixes. Now, how can you find the best mixture of plants for your hanging baskets, but with minimum of fuss? Now, we'll talk about how there are mixes that are now specially engineered, so they'll grow all at the same speed, so you don't get one that takes over from the rest. It's brilliant. It really is the best move in basket plants for many years. We'll also talk about Yael's baby project, which is Verbena. And we'll talk about mildew-free, big, voluptuous Verbena too. Then Lantana. Yael's got some very surprising and different Lantana that hopefully will work much better in a Northern European, aka dull climate. And we also talk about Bidens and how the whole world of Bidens has changed over the last few years. The article that I'll create to go with this podcast will include a lot of the images of the plants that we talk about as well. So that will make it easier for you to then visualize the plants that I'm chit-chatting about. Also in this podcast, I'm going to look at that interaction too, but we're going to put that at the end of the podcast after we've taken you on that little journey through the world of new plants. First up, we've got Syracuse Mole from Bacon Camp, and she's gonna chat us through how we glue different plants together to make a whole new one. Recorded at Spoga German Trade Fair back in September, here's Syracuse and me chit-chatting about plants. My favorite thing to do. Okay, I'm here with a very good friend of mine who I've worked with for a number of years called Syracuse Moll, and she works in international marketing at the company Bacon Camp in the Netherlands. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the new plants that she's helped to introduce over the years. Also, talk about a few projects that her and I've worked on together as well. So, welcome Syracuse, how are you? Hey, Michael. Yeah? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool, so. Tell me what your job involves, because it's really developed over the years, and you run a lot of the trade shows like we're at now. You run a lot of the displays that Bacon Camp puts on at those shows, don't you? Yeah, so my main responsibility is the marketing for mm -hmm. the company, and I work with retail. I run a run retail team and a marketing team uh, yeah, for uh, worldwide, so wow. it's really good. That I must, like a it. lot of traveling, yeah? Love it, though. Wow. It's very That's interesting cool. to see all the cultures, to yeah. speak to different people. Yeah. 
Cool. And obviously, you're working behind the scenes as well, influencing a lot of the new product decisions at Bacon Camp too. And we actually worked together on a very big project, mm -hmm. probably about 15 years ago, which was the Tom Tato. Yeah, it started yeah. 15 years ago. I, I can't believe how long. It was a crazy is. project. I remember us sitting around a board a board table one day, and we were just talking about the idea. It was like, can we really make that reality? Mm. So, kind of just run us through crudely what the Tom Tato was. So you came. Uh, to us for that idea, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we were talking Knocking about it. Knocking on your door with another like, crazy idea. Yeah. <laughs> and we thought, oh, that's Michael. Yeah. So uh, I actually thought it was a really nice idea, yeah. and um, <laughs> so we we had a look into it, and yeah, it was a whole process. It's, it took about five years or so, mm -hmm. and we had to find the right potato and the right tomato, and everybody could like enjoy like loads of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And then we found the right combination. Remember that? Yeah. And then we had to launch it. That's amazing. So, because you actually had to take, because you, you were growing the potato plants from seed, mm -hmm. yeah, to make baby plants of potatoes. Right. And yeah. at the same time you made baby plants of tomatoes. Yeah. And then what you did? You just cut the top off one and put it on the other? Is basically, it really that easy? It is, yeah. Basically. Ah. Well, it sounds easy. <laughs> it sounds easier than it is, but those are the basics. It's we have mm -hmm. to kind of glue it. No GMO, mm -hmm. nothing like that. But we had to graft it. It's called grafting. Mm -hmm. So we specialize as a company, we specialize in grafting. And yeah, we made it happen eventually because wow. it took a few years. <laughs> so you glued years. them together, but they had little pegs on as well, yeah. didn't they? The baby plants. Yeah. Okay. To keep it together. Wow. And of course, it wasn't just any variety of tomato and potato because this was a concept that had been done since war times, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. But what we put was a good cropping potato down there. Yeah. And a high cropping tomato. And, That's right. And got a good combo. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It was like the fries. And yeah. the tomato ketchup. Of course, yeah. yeah. And when we launched it um, in the US, it was called Ketchup and Fries Plant, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you've it, seen great sales success with this plant now? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And still people are, are surprised by it yeah. and cover it, what we had. Both uh, you and me worldwide, it was amazing. Yeah, it was oh, really that's good really physics. cool. Yeah, I remember when we launched it at Thompson Morgan, we took it onto the BBC One show, lots of different press coverage. Really cool because it was younger people were talking about it as if it was like Frankenstein food because it was yeah. something they hadn't seen before that seemed completely crazy. But of course, it is natural, non-GMO. Yeah. No. Nope. It just works, doesn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, groundbreaking, I That's think. Cool. Yeah, hit and all the media. I know. And then the second part of that project, we were looking at what else was in that family and what, what do we try next? <laughs> There are loads of possibilities, yeah. but you have to find the right variety. Mm -hmm. And it has to work. We don't want the consumer to be disappointed mm. with the results. So at the moment, the Tom Tato still gives the best results. As you know, more than 200, 300 really sweet tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And the potatoes are really nice and fluffy. fluffy. Everybody knows a uh, potato. Mm -hmm. So we want to find something what is really worth it. Yeah. In the but then next we tried an aubergine, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Did that go well? <laughs> it it was, didn't sell that well. but no, it, it was, was not as popular. It was probably, in my mind, more innovative because obviously tomatoes and potatoes have been done for 100 years, but yeah. nobody had put an eggplant on top of a potato. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but people didn't really know it. And yeah. the aubergine, I think as well at the time, was not that. Yeah, yeah. if it was now actually, with I the vegan so. movement, it might Absolutely. be a little bit different. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. But of course, as you say, there's a lot more that can be done in that family. We don't want to give too much away, but if you look up all the plants that are in Solanaceae family, we it's possible to blend those. Choice there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. so. Okay, so that was an edible that we've worked mm -hmm. on together. How about begonias? Because you're big in begonias at Bacon Camp, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I think uh, begonias is one of our, it's our passion, but yeah. also one of the biggest crop for us. And we do like the upright begonias. We have uh, our dreams begonias. Uh, mm -hmm. We are breeding and developing the begonia for the new generation. Mm -hmm. So you can put it indoor and outdoor and it will flower till the, till the first frost. And then we had a project, project 
about the Fragrant mm -hmm. Falls, yeah, remember? Yeah, that was from Thompson & Morgan, wasn't it? Yeah. Because uh, Fragrant Begonias are not easy to come by, and I remember our breeder Charles was crossing them with, I think, a species called Socotrana, right. which actually flowered in the winter, so mm. they had to freeze the pollen in order to then have it in the right season. But you guys then helped us to develop that, bring it to a commercial audience, and, and now it's sold as Fragrant Falls, I yeah, believe. Fragrant yeah, Fragrant Falls and Perfume Dreams. Wow. Yeah. But you've also done a lot of work yourself with the Alatia types, which are the kind of common houseplant ones that used to need a lot of sticks for support. Mm -hmm. They weren't so floriferous, but now you can grow them inside and outside, can't you? Exactly. So uh, the new generation of begonia, the flowering begonia, begonia is quite an uh, uh, old fashioned mm. product. And everybody thinks about the grandparents to mm. see it like on the windowsill. Um, but we want to have the begonia, which has like loads of color, um, is vigorous, it's growing, the whole summer troop can stand shade or mm -hmm. sun. And um, yeah, we won recently a prize for it as well, oh, the Fluoro, uh, Fluoro Awards. And was that with the new red one? Yeah. Was, yeah. The Macaroos and the Macaros. Ha ha. So that is for us also gr groundbreaking that only one plant gives such a feel such a big pot. Wow, so you're giving consumers a lot more, not to say more choice, but more choice within the different plants. So they're actually able to be grown in different areas. They're more weather resistant, resilient. Exactly. I love what you've done with dahlias as well, because you've got this shorter mm -hmm. patio range mm -hmm. with cactus flowers. Yes, <sighs> they're gorgeous, aren't they? Yeah, what's the range called? So it's the Labella series. Yeah. And we have several sizes, and as we say, like from big to small, we have it all in the dahlias. Mm. And we are developing the dahlias so people can still enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you have like those cacti, cactus flowery type, or just the normal dahlia type, you can put them on a patio, beautiful, mm -hmm. when they are in full flower, and you think like, mm, maybe I want to get rid of a few because there are too many flowers. You can just cut them off and put them in a vase inside. Wow, that's brilliant. So yeah, if works. you haven't got a garden, you can still grow some of the biggest and best dahlias. Oh yeah. You're yeah. giving gardeners like more options. It's amazing. I love that. Yeah, we are looking into the world is changing mm. and and the plant business uh, yeah people have a certain thought and a presuming about what mm. to say about the begonias for your grandparents. And you want to bring new life into it because we really feel it's worth and we want to have plants where the cons consumer can enjoy it. Or, whole time and mm. they don't have to look after it too much yeah, either. Yeah, true. It's like an impulse buy, they can put it on the patio the same day when mm. they have the party and yeah. Well, make it easy but also give them confidence that they can grow and then they'll come back in the future yeah. and grow more and extend the choice that they're going to give as well. And make it fun. Yeah, oh, like definitely. Like it's on Yeah, yeah, and all the bright colours. Oh, love it. But I've got a couple more questions just for you because obviously born in the Netherlands but mm -hmm. then Grew up, not grew up, but obviously spent a lot of your working career in the UK. What differences do you notice between how Dutch people garden and how English people garden? Because well, I think that's a very interesting question. That is an interesting yeah. question. And um, I love the gardening style in the UK. Yeah. They, people seem to have sorts of big, big knowledge uh -huh. about plants. Yeah. And they understand <clears throat> the plants very good. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Netherlands, people are very proud of the garden. When, mm. you, when you drive through the Netherlands, you look at the gardens, it's normally like top notch and people want to show off their garden too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there, is, there is a difference in style and how they fill in the garden, mm. but still the love and the passion for the plants is for both countries yeah. quite the same. Okay, because yeah. Yeah, Dutch gardens are always really kind of uniform and tidy looking, yeah. which is nice in its own way. Very organized yeah. kind of thing. But then English gardens tend to have this real kind of lackadaisical kind of like yeah. organized chaos. Yeah, <laughs> and I love it. I, I love both, oh. to be honest. Yeah. But what about the type of products? Like what products would do well in the Netherlands versus UK? Yeah, you see in the UK that uh, you have still more the traditional yeah. varieties because yeah. people do remember the name. Yeah, and, and it's hard to make them move on sometimes. Mm. Sometimes okay. um, yeah. I feel that there are better products on mm. the market, better varieties. But, you know, I also still respect the love and the passion and the knowledge yeah. from the garden. It just takes a bit longer to switch them on to new varieties. Yeah. Whereas in Holland, people are looking at new ideas, embracing them a lot quicker, would you say? Um, 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I guess because they see more of the industry, it's a lot more visual to them, isn't it? Yeah, and and the Netherlands is very well known for the flowers and plants, so mm. they they get educated a little bit differently about mm-hmm. it than in the UK. I think. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you. It's been great to work with you over the years on all these new intros, and I love what you guys do as a company, and you're really like changing the look of our gardens, not just in the UK, but across Europe. So thank you. Well, thank you. No problem. (laughs) So there you go, a bit more of the story behind that amazing ketchup and fries plant, and also the egg and chips plant. But what else could you create in that family? Have a little think about what is in Solanaceae family. So you've got peppers, aubergines, tomatoes, potatoes, but also some flowers as well. So that is pretty exciting what you could create in the future with that. And at the end of the podcast, we're going to look through your fantasy league plants. I've been asking you guys on social media, what one plant would you love to breed in this world? So please keep making comments, tag us with the plant-based podcast, let us know what is on your fantasy league of plants as well now in part two we're gonna have a little visit to Danziger which is in Israel which is the home of delicious hummus but did you know that hummus traditionally you eat with slices of onion to use for the dipping yes you're not going to kiss anybody after that are you But anyway, I've been making visits to new plant nurseries, breeders for more than 20 years now. Even my first visit, no, the, the actual reason I had to get a passport when I was 18 was to make my first visit to a company called Sahin, which was in Holland. And I went there as one of my first jobs at Thompson & Morgan, literally a week after I joined. And I remember having an amazing time finding out about lots of new plants, spending time with a real plantsman called Case Sahin as well. Not sure if anybody out there from the industry is listening and remembers this guy. He was incredible. He was fueled by pink champagne. And we used to drive around until until dusk, you know, hunting down new plants or he was showing me his peony beds. Absolutely amazing trips. Also in my first few weeks at Thompson Morgan, I was I was traveling to Scotland to collect the first star-shaped flowered petunia. I was also driving down to London to collect a delphinium that had black flowers on as well. So it was such an amazing time. And I've started to do some presentations talking about my life in plants very recently. So it's it's kind of strange when you get to this age of 40, you start to look down on your life from above almost as if it's a kind of a best of program. So I'm kind of having so many epiphanies at the moment where I remember all these great trips over the years. But anyway, it proves that I can waffle on just as much on my own as I can with Ellen. I'm gonna take you into part two, which is my visit to Danziger Trials in Israel. And I have a little chat to the marketing, no, the product manager and the breeder at Danziger and her name is Yael. So enjoy. Okay, I'm here with Yael who is working at Danziger as the product manager, formerly a breeder, and I'm gonna find out all about the world of new plants. So we're starting off with one of my favorites, which is Petunia Queen of Hearts, which wasn't actually bred to have a heart in the flower but it actually has five hearts in each petal. So I'm gonna ask Yael about the whole story of breeding at Danziger, kind of about you and your heritage, your career. So yeah, let's kick off. So give us a quick introduction to your role here at Danziger. Okay, so I've been working at Danziger for about three and a half years. Previously, I was working at a breeding company, a seed breeding company, it's called Hazera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been there a geneticist and also I, I've been helping with the breeding. Mm-hmm. Uh, since I came to Danziger, I've been a breeder. I, I'm breeding Verbena. Uh-huh. And uh, for the past half a year, I started being uh, started the job of uh, product manager. Uh-huh. It's a new role here in Danziger. So. Oh, okay, so you're still breeding as well or you're yeah. moving across? Yeah, okay, so you're trying to do a dual role job. Yeah, which is uh-huh. starting. <laughs> yeah, but that's quite fun because actually 
you're breeding the plants that you're then looking to go on and develop yeah, yeah, exactly. and market, which yeah. is really nice. Yeah, so I'm also involved in uh -huh. the breeder in the breeding process for all the breeders. Now. Yeah, okay. So the plant we're looking at right now is Petunia Queen of Hearts, which is kind of, I think this has become Danziger's flagship product yeah. and it's become so popular. Yeah, she's our Not queen. just in the industry, but with the public as well. Yeah. Explain this because it, it wasn't intended to breed it that way. Who spotted the heart? How did that come about? Uh, well, it was our uh, marketing manager, yeah. our previous marketing manager, uh -huh. that, yeah, that she saw the heart. Yeah. Um, you're right. We liked it first because of very good habit, mm -hmm. very strong uh, plant performance. We liked the, the colors, we liked the shape of it. Mm -hmm. But then they, they told us about the heart. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a um, very, very strong plant. That's cool. And it really proves to me that new plants are not always brand new breeding. Sometimes it's a different way of looking, looking exactly. at a plant we already yeah, know. Exactly. And of course, that range is now built into kind of about five different varieties now, yeah. all with the heart. Yeah. yeah, and we have different uh, uh, varieties of uh, colors, but uh, mm -hmm. they all have the same habits, the same performance, flower the same time. Ah, okay. And here we've got a plant, this is a new one, isn't yeah, it? This isn't released chic. to the public yet, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, for 2021. Hippie chick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you're almost here, you're, I see what you're doing here, you're selecting for a different shaped kind yeah. of pattern on the yeah. bloom again. Yeah, we're yeah. always looking for difference, uh -huh. for something new to be innovative. Yeah, it's really, it looks kind of high res, the way it kind of makes the purple yeah. in the center yeah, stand yeah. out. Yeah, it stands out. Yeah. Whenever you go to uh, exhibition, this one stands out. I would almost call that the seashell, seashell <laughs> petunia though, because of how that edge is. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's really different. But what else have we got in petunias? Because are you selecting for fragrance as well? We're testing fragrance. Mm -hmm. uh, we still don't have a product in that area, mm -hmm. but we are testing it. Uh, we're standing now in front of the Capella, uh -huh. which is our uh, favorite uh, uh, series. Uh -huh. The specialty of the Capella is that it starts small, mm -hmm. so it's very convenient, it's good for the grid for the growers, okay. and then it's very good for the end consumer because uh -huh. it continues growing. Usually when something is compact, it stays compact. This uh -huh. is uniqueness. It starts compact, but then keeps on growing. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. And obviously fragrance is coming usually in the purple. So the purple in that range has got the, the fragrance, I guess. Mm. No. No? <laughs> Not A little so bit much. <laughs> less weak. Okay, and then there's one here which caught my eye, caught my eye earlier, which is a bit camouflaged. Where is, where's that one, the greeny one? Ah, the yeah. pistachio? Yeah, because yeah. it almost looks like foliage, doesn't yeah. it? It's very, very, very special. Yeah. It's also an eye catcher in the uh, exhibitions. Yeah, wow. Yeah. But I think this would be a real, do you know what I mean when I call something a marmite plant? I, I know what's marmite. Yeah, like, well, why? in England we say something's marmite where you either love it or you hate it. Uh, and this seems to be one yeah. of those plants. And it is, it is. <laughs> For me, I, love, I yeah. like it very much. I also like it because it's very strong. Mm. Petunia is one of the... You can see, you see, now we have a wind here and you see mm -hmm. everything is falling down and yeah. this stays. Yeah. It's really strong. It's and strong flower... like, a, like a cabbage. Yeah. That's not a compliment though, is <laughs> no, it? No, <laughs> no, it's beautiful and it's great in mixes. Aha. With the red petunia, mm -hmm. it's really nice. Because mixes have actually developed a lot over the years with a lot of big breeding companies yeah. like you guys. Yeah. yeah. And it's more than just mixing up plants in a basket, isn't yeah. it? There's yeah. a lot more thought goes into yeah. those, Yeah, we're there? testing to see that they all uh, get the same breeding, the, the same growing conditions, mm -hmm. that it needs the same uh, PGRs or doesn't need PGR, mm -hmm. uh, the same um, flowering time. Okay. But it looks that no one looks uh, taking over the other. So mm -hmm. all the plants that it still looks good together, we're testing them here in Israel and also abroad to see how it mm -hmm. looks. And only then we are releasing them. Okay, because the worst thing is to plant up a mixed basket exactly. and then suddenly the Bidens take over. Because uh, yeah. it's always the yeah. Bidens. <laughs> Sometimes the bite uh, of the petunias, it depends, yeah. Yeah. Now this project here is one of your babies, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. One of your favorites. This mm -hmm. is Verbena. So what have you done here? So our Vanessa, mm -hmm. uh, the flag of the our Vanessa is that it's uh, powdery mildew resistant. Mm -hmm. Okay? So all of our varieties are tested for powdery mildew. We are inoculating them and testing to see the resistance, both mm -hmm. here in Israel and abroad. Um, all of them are very unified in terms of habit and flowering time. Mm -hmm. It has uh, abundance of flower and um, uh, cycling of color. Okay, nice. And uh, 
I see that they're kind of, how they're used here is nice in a container, but in UK, we usually use them just mixed in a basket, kind of not on their own, as you see here, which is nice. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah, yeah. Usually, verbena is sold as a mixes, and we yeah. also have over there an uh, example of a verbena mix. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And up here is a plant that you'd usually be used to seeing on holiday, lantana. lantana. <laughs> but here is a much more bushy, kind of compact form. Yeah. And the color change is amazing. Where's that's my favorite one, which is the pink opal. Uh -huh. Look at that color change, yeah. it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's really different from what we used to know as yeah. lantana. Also, as we grew up on lantanas, they were used to be very large on the, on the roadside uh -huh. and stuff. Yeah. And now the breeder took it and made it more compact, more like mm -hmm. a round shape uh, and controlled habit. And mm -hmm. also, um, no fertility, so it will not become like invasive. Ah, okay, but we could only dream of that being invasive in Northern Europe. <laughs> we're <laughs> okay, we're lucky if it grows. <laughs> <laughs> but are these better for Northern Europe as well, in lower light levels too? Uh, we checked them also, yeah. but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're also good there. Okay, this is another lovely one. But this yeah. is only a code name at the moment. Yeah, that must be really for, new. It's, yeah, it's experimental. Wow. It's for 2023. But look at that. That's like red moving through to orange and... And wow. a very large flower in a large yeah. cluster. It calls you out from, from, from a distance. Oh. And this is still experimental and we hope to bring some more colors in this, uh, oh. in this habit, in this That's shape. amazing. And mm -hmm. people just don't grow this in this way in the UK. Mm -hmm. It'd be well, great. I It'd be such it a change. Yeah. yeah. And how do you go to... Like, obviously this is bushy. The original is a massive kind of shrub. How do you kind of make it smaller? Do you cross hybridize it or do you select it's, and select? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it starts... This is all the breeding procedure is the same. We do process. Mm -hmm and then we do selections. Okay. So we do we take a very small plant and cross it with a very big and then mm -hmm. do selections for the medium plants or for the small plants. Mm. We, we take uh, traits from the father and from the mother and then okay. select in the offsprings. Uh -huh. And that, do you plant out a lot in order yeah. to then select down? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it could be a thousand plants sometimes yeah. Yeah. just to get the one that yeah. you want. We're saying always it's a, yeah. a game of numbers. <laughs> wow. So what about Calibra Cur? Because that is like a miniature petunia, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's stronger. Yeah, but I don't know if it's caught on enough in the UK yet. Mm. We used to sell Million Bells many years ago, but that was quite pH sensitive. Mm -hmm. So I think people are a little bit turned off to the fact of that. But mm -hmm. Calibra Cur is a surefire shot for gardens because yeah. it's got so much bloom, yeah, as you say. Yeah, yeah, and so a lot of color range. Mm. It's really strong in the in the US. It's uh, the leading... Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. like Why is that? Because petunias burn out? Or? Yeah, petunias are more sensitive than Calibra okay. You saw it. You saw the, uh -huh. the petals and everything. Yeah, I guess Calibra Coas, the flowers are a lot smaller, so they're a lot more yeah, exactly. rain resistant uh, already. Exactly, and they stay open and everything. Uh -huh. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Now this plant, I think this plant's got potential, but it's yeah. a bit of a shy flowerer. <laughs> what is this then? <laughs> Yeah, well, now it's not the time for it. Yeah. So this is why it looks like that. I can tell you that I've seen it in full bloom. Mm -hmm. It's like a ball of gold. Mm. And it's James Britannia. James Britannia. Which kind of so. crudely is a kind of coloured in bacopa. It's almost it, like a kid painted it with crayons, isn't it? <laughs> it, it it's from the same uh, family. It's yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... James Britannia has a bad reputation, mm -hmm. but we hope to restore it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we have selected for varieties that don't have problems in rooting. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, we hope to see uh, James Britannia coming back. Yeah, so the reputation there is about its rooting and production, not yeah. necessarily as a garden plant. No, so no. I think people need to realize that a good garden plant needs to be good at every level of the journey, doesn't for it? It sure. needs to root for well, sure. it needs to grow well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not just one part of it. It's very complex mm -hmm. to get it right. Mm -hmm. And Nemesia, obviously these are the sort of plants you can smell before you can see them. Yeah. And you've selected some great shorter dwarf varieties mm -hmm. here. Do they flower well through the summer? They don't burn out? Either? Yeah, this is what we selected for. These specifically are mm. for late in the season. They start in the spring, late in the season, and then go into the summer. Mm -hmm. Nice, and I love these marbled ones here. What's that, tutti frutti? Tutti frutti. Cool, and the fragrance is just like yeah. vanilla, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's strong, oh, yeah. Very special. It's strange because they never used to sell very well in mail order, because when you've got a picture of an Nemesia on the page, it just looks like a big cloud. Whereas when you see it in the garden centre, it's much more of an impulse purchase, because yeah. you can smell it, you can, wow, and you can really feel it, yeah. yeah. Oh, now this like plant, yeah, this was my favorite <laughs> at 9 a.m. this morning, yeah. but, 
No. Do they always close yeah. at this time of day? Yeah. Ah. But what a portulaca. And to just describe this to you, portulaca are usually just a few inches tall, but this is almost a foot tall, mm -hmm. about a foot across. It's like a monster shrubby form yep. of portulaca. And I've predict a big future for this plant. Yeah, I as long also... as it stays open more often. Yeah, <laughs> really, this is our goal. Yeah. But this is really, it's a great plant for um, for the futuristic uh, mm -hmm. uh, person because we don't have time. We yeah. don't have time to take care of our plants. So this is low maintenance and uh, flowers all the time. It's very nice. We need to make it open. Mm. Uh, <laughs> have you also heard of xeriscaping? That's a movement in America where they use as little water as possible to garden. So basically mm -hmm. using plants like succulents, like portulaca yeah. that hold on to the moisture. They also cover the ground with gravel or bark to conserve as much water That's as possible. Great. That's great. And this would be perfect yeah, for that. Yeah, this would Definitely. be perfect. This and Delosperma also. Yes, of course. Uh, just a couple more to finish off. I just want to wander over to the, the Bidens because that's mm -hmm. another plant that's really changed in the kind of garden and pot landscape the last few years because there's colors now we couldn't have imagined many years ago so how how's that happened because i'm thinking biden's is kind of yellow and orange palette but suddenly i've got a pink here yeah how's that get here yeah exactly <laughs> there in the wild there are different species of biden's mm. so our breeder what he did she did uh, she took uh, wild species with different colors mm -hmm. it took her a very long time and a lot of hard work okay. to make it it looks a lot bigger in the wild. It's yeah. very, you know, it's like bushy and it's invasive. So she wanted to make it more controlled habit mm -hmm. and she made it finally. Mm, that's cool. But this shows that like to create new plants, sometimes you have to go back to original species. For sure. And I know with the diacea over there, you've gone back to some older species exactly. too, in order to give that variation. Mm -hmm. So it must be kind of fun, like working in a sweet shop sometimes yeah. you know you know we have a, a, a breeder here who specializes it in uh -huh. it and he goes all over the world and bring uh -huh. a new species so that's very very interesting uh-huh and a few english favorites we've got some new calendulas some new english marigolds here that are being trialed yeah. we've also got a new lavender Mm -hmm. over there which has got some of the biggest flowers i've ever seen yeah, too. Lila. yeah, yeah really Lila. really nice mm -hmm. and you said earlier this was one of your best sellers as well this yeah the golden double flower coriolis yeah yeah this one is perennial mm -hmm. the golden sphere very beautiful oh. when it's full of bloom mm -hmm. you will see like a bowl of yellow flowers amazing wow that is cool mm -hmm. thank you you've got such cool stuff going on here and Thank it's not you. just bedding plants patio plants but also perennial plants that are great for the patio but also for the border too mm -hmm. so yeah you must love your job yeah I do. wow <laughs> and it is like being in the sweet shop like willy wonka's chocolate factory of plants isn't <laughs> yeah it? cool thank you very much thanks, thanks. so there you go a little tour of danziger's trial grounds now, my favorite item really was that portulaca. It was just like it was on steroids. The flowers were giant. The plant was more like a shrub than it was a small, low-growing, rockery portulaca. It was just incredible. So hopefully that will come to our shores in Northern Europe very soon. But right now, we're going to look at Fantasy Plant League because the theme of this podcast is all about new plants and plants that can be created and kind of letting your imagination run wild a little bit. And that's exactly what we did with the egg and chips plant and the and the tomato, for example. So let's have a little look at the comments you guys gave on social media when I asked you, what would be on your fantasy plant league? What plant do you wish existed in the natural world? And the photo that I used to um, illustrate this is one that is often going around on the internet, which is a strawberry with a kiwi flesh inside. I mean, they sell seeds for this. And it's crazy because I can't believe that anybody would ever fall for this. It's like, come on, guys. <laughs> but anyway, so that is the picture. Um, you can easily search kiwi strawberry and you'll find that online. But please don't buy the seed because it just will not grow. Doesn't exist. I wonder what seeds they send instead, actually. <laughs> so anyway, a few comments here. We've got Fuchsias in the city. He would like to create the biggest, plumpest, juiciest fuchsia berry crossed with a strawberry. Mm, that's quite interesting because fuchsias have edible berries. 
They're not always that tasty. Sometimes they're a little bit gritty. At Thompson Morgan, we actually bred like the best fuchsia berry. So it was kind of plump, almost like the cherry without a stone. But to cross that with a strawberry is kind of, that is a little bit of witchcraft there. Fuchsia's in the city. Uh, next, ooh, ooh, ooh. Sam Proctor says calorie-free chocolate. <laughs> uh, I think it's more to do with how it's processed. Maybe you need to stick to the cocoa. Ah, uh, so Ed on Twitter, who is Epistmeist. Oh, I've never read out. Um, I've never had to read out Twitter handles before. They're really confusing. Uh, his fantasy part is the size and exterior of a watermelon, but the inside is a custard apple. <laughs> So like a giant custard apple. I have never tasted the flesh of a custard apple, so I'm trusting you that that would be an amazing plant and that's why you want to create it. RMKW on Twitter says luminescent orchids. Ah, yeah, well, there's probably some painted ones out there, but true luminescent, not necessarily. I do really love iridescent plants though. There's a few begonias, some moss, that are iridescent because they kind of shimmer to make the most of the light that is not available on the rainforest floor. Ben Cartledge on Twitter says, tomatoes that were instant Bloody Marys. <laughs> um, then we've got a few comments on Facebook. So Jackie Townsend, I'm not sure she knows how plants work because she says a cheese and mushroom plant. <laughs> Mushrooms are kind of a plant, but cheese is coming from an animal, Jackie. Uh, Elaine Everton, strawberry and pineapple. Wow, have you ever seen the pineberry, which is the white fleshed strawberry that allegedly has a taste of pineapple? So your dreams have come true already. A carnivorous plant that targets mosquitoes, says Charlie McDonald. Ha, huh, that would need some huge traps, wouldn't it? Louise Manning, a blessed bamboo that wasn't as toxic as my puppies love to eat my plants. Oh, there's a few other plants that are in Chinese folklore, especially Lucky Charms, which could be worth looking out for. So there's bound to be a way or keep the pets away by um, smearing mustard on the stems or something like that. <laughs> Please don't take that advice, anyone. <laughs> Uh, Kirsty Finlay says peach and mango. Woo. David Middlehurst, friend of mine, says a beer plant. He obviously hasn't heard of hops. <laughs> Nigel Kite has a really good idea, which is a diorama whose flowers are fragrant like a strong dianthus. Nice idea. Lisa MG says egg and chips plant. Oh, been there, done that. <laughs> and and lastly, Christine Sheffield says a weed eating plant. Well, if you plant more plants, you actually get less weeds because there isn't the space for those weeds to come through. So there you go. Problem solved already. Tick. <laughs> So yes, we are a few days into the new year. So I asked you guys on social media, what are your new year resolutions when it comes to gardening? Some of mine would be to actually garden <laughs> because I've been so busy and kind of pulled around the UK and also uh, to some degree the world like filming the last couple of years. So I've not had any garden of my own, which is such a confession. So sorry if that lets you all down, guys. But I do have a few houseplants in an apartment. So that is the best I can do at the moment, but I miss it like crazy. Anyway, your resolution. So Paul Huber on Twitter says, a new home by spring with a tiny yard. So a plan for tiny yard gardening. That's actually the best type of gardening because do you know what? I gotta say gardening, it takes a lot of time. We spend a lot of time making it sound simple, but actually to take care of a largest garden is a full-time job. So tiny gardens are, I think the next big thing. <laughs> Ian Tinton says water and soil management to the fore. Brilliant. Bex Cameron says vegetables, lots of vegetables in deep round pots and snaking tendrils of pumpkin everywhere. And I wish fruits could somehow be nomadic. 
Hmm? Fruits. I'm not sure what she means with the fruits, but pumpkins trailing everywhere sounds pretty cool. Raker and Baker, Amanda Rake to Bake says, grow more varieties of tomato, more than two. She's got her eye on some from Medwins, uh, and she's going to raid her seed box for a cherry type and a pink type. Oh, pink tomatoes. Nice. Ella Beard from Twitter says, plant trees. Well, at least five trees. That's good. Every little counts. Jenny Tunley Price is going to get her monster polytunnel up and productive. Sam Alderson is going to grow uh, her own fruit and vegetables and get a new vegetable patch set up. So, so many grow your own resolutions here. It's amazing. Nathan Chenery, all oh, to properly tackle nettles and ground elder in a new garden. Oh, I don't envy you. Sorry. On Facebook, we've got Una Bird who says, get good results from Save Seed from this year's Stunning Plants. Excellent. I really miss saving seed from plants. But remember, it doesn't all come true. If there's some plants that hybridize with others, such as aquilegias can be really promiscuous, then you might not get the true thing with the results of your seeds. But it's always fun anyway. Uh, Lynn Cauldron says to get a gardening seat kneeler instead of using a pad to lean on for her weeding. Cool. Ah la la. Jeff Eyre awaiting the 500 plus assorted spring bulbs to sprout through the soil. That's a great feeling. I think they'll be up before you expect it as well. Rita Mazritsky, I hope I've said that right, says to grow more salad and to try to grow some soft fruits. Start with strawberries. Strawberries are a really good place to start. Uh, Leslie Palmer says to start her degree in horticulture, I believe. She's a great ambassador for the, the industry and learning about horticulture. Then Lennox Toplin, to keep doing what I'm doing, except backwards with heels on. <laughs> That's great. I also wear heels in the garden. <laughs> uh, any others here? Deidre Power, not to buy as much. Well, that doesn't please me because obviously I'm recommending plants to you guys all the time that I think you should buy because they're the next cool thing in gardens. So anyway, thank you for joining me with this podcast episode and I hope it hasn't been too boring for you to hear me throughout. Um, it's really great to talk to you guys about new plants as well. Ellen and I have recently talked about perhaps a couple of spin-off shows and one of those could be kind of delving deeper into kind of like uh, kind of plant geek breeding sites, kind of talking to breeders, kind of, you know, really kind of uncovering that secret world of new plants. So I hope this has been a nice taster for you all. Please do leave a comment, leave us a review, please, because we really love those, especially when they're five star. If they're not going to be five star, then let us know first why they're not going to be five stars. So thank you guys for joining us. And yes, the next episode is out in two weeks. And Ellen is in charge of the knobs and levers for that one. So give her lots of love. See you soon, guys. Love you all. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Plant Based Podcast. Have a browse of the rest of the library or hop on over to the website, which is theplantbasedpodcast.net. You'll also find our social media links. Please connect with us and let us know about any plant-based projects that you think we should be covering on the show. And make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you'll be the first to hear the next episode. We're releasing once a fortnight. So until next time, enjoy the world of plants.